Welcome to another inspiring and timely message from our pastors here at the Crossroads. The, the point of this message today, where we're going to end it, where I'm starting it, is love them to the end. We want to we wanna go the distance, not just out of a sense of uh, being stoic, suck it up, do, do what's right. No, but we want to love them to the end. Love those around you, love your family, love your children, go through the process, and sometimes it can be a, a challenging journey. But his grace is sufficient, and he will not place on any of us more than we can handle. I'm not telling you to take abuse. I'm not telling you to allow people to beat you up. I'm not telling people, you know, you to put up with things that you shouldn't put up with. But I believe that God can give us a beautiful grace so that as we get to the end, like in the last half of the wedding party, saving the best wine for last so that it's all good. So love them to the end. John chapter 13, verse 1, actually does say, in the last part of the verse, it says, Jesus loved them to the end, which means to the last, utterly and completely. Jesus wants to love us to the end. John chapter 13 is the Passover feast. It is the Last Supper. Uh, you see the beautiful Leonardo da Vinci painting, The Last Supper, where Jesus is at the center of it. And, and uh, so beautiful, so amazing. The grace and love of our Savior. Here he was with his disciples that had been with him for three and a half years. And they revolutionized the world around them. And, in little Israel, but at the same time revolutionized the entire world, turning the world upside down or right side up, depending on how you look at it. But talk about a revolutionary. Jesus was a revolutionary, and he was a conqueror. He was a, a mighty king, but he was also one who laid his life down freely. And so you see him in that painting, all serene, beautiful. But something happened as they were having that last supper, as he was breaking the bread of life himself before them. And truly, this was a moment where he was teaching an illustrated sermon, not only giving them the bread and the wine, speaking of what he was about to do with his life, but also in demonstrating it because we can say things and we can say, oh, bless you, sister, we just love you so much. And then we move on to whatever it is we're doing, you know. But here he was actually demonstrating it to them because here in the scripture, it, it, it shares that he took his coat off. You know, I've got my jacket on now, but, you know, he took his coat off. And then he did something very unusual for his society in his world. And it says that he took his coat off and he put an apron on him and he girded, it's an old English word, we don't use it much anymore, but he girded up himself with a rope and he tied that rope to hold that apron in place because he was getting ready to get down and get real, get down and get dirty, deal with the issues and the challenge that he knew that was lying before him. He was about to enter in to the passion. He was about to enter in to that time that we're going to be celebrating and it's so beautiful. We got all the pretty flowers and you wear all the pretty dresses and we just, oh, it's so wonderful. But he was about to enter into that dark hour. And he wanted to teach them an illustration that evening as they were participating of supper. They had had many meals together. But this particular night, and he did it in kind of a different order because normally it was a custom in that time that 
Even back then, people would bathe. But then during the course of the day, because they were wearing sandals, they would get to an event to come the evening, and they needed their feet washed. It was a very normal thing in their society. It didn't have, you know, nice shoes on and sealed with socks and uh, all hermetically sealed, so to speak, against the, the dust of life, but wearing those sandals. And so, so in the evening, uh, if you were going to have dinner, you would have your feet washed. But the master of the party did not do that. That was not done. Who would do that? Well, it was the one wearing that apron. Who wore the apron? The servant. Who wore that apron? Not only just a servant, but in that particular society, it wouldn't have been the one that was your waitress at the restaurant you go to this afternoon where they get minimum wage, but then because of good service, you throw in that 20%, amen? Right, Tony, you give them that 20%, right? Not just get by, you give them that 20%. But this was not that kind of a servant. These were slaves. That meant that even if the master just had them go sleep in the corner at night, but maybe a little thin blanket, but to be on call close by in case the master t stubbed his toe going to the restroom, and cried out that the slave would be there to meet every single need of the master. And so here we had the rabbi, the master, the Lord, the governor, the ruler, the one who had taught them for three and a half years. They were his disciples, and yet all of a sudden, the rabbi took off his coat, put on the apron, girded himself up, put a towel over his shoulder, got a basin of water, and began to wash his disciples' feet. This was mind-boggling. And they, they didn't exactly, and it wasn't like they just immediately said, oh, please, can we help you? They were just like dumbfounded. that it, They didn't know what exactly it was coming off, but Jesus did all these unusual things and just about the time they thought they had things figured out he would surprise them because they needed to think they needed to reason together they needed to see through a different perspective than what society had taught them that the, well, the slaves do that that's the dirty work for the slaves yet here was the rabbi washing their dirty feet. Now this message isn't about personal hygiene. It's about a spiritual cleansing and cleaning that needs to occur in our lives. And how we are to love them to the end. Life gets complicated. And sometimes those that we are the closest to are also the people that bring us the most pain. A lot of complex emotions that go on in relationships. The dynamics between husband and wives. Partners on a job. People you deal with on a regular basis. You probably like them, but then also they know you. And because you've had that interaction going on, also it becomes the people with whom you can be the most disappointed. Feel that down. Feel like, well, if anyone should get me, it should be the one that's closest to me. And yet, Jesus is saying, love, he loved them to the end, even though he knew that literally in the hours to come, and I realize this is a big illustration for all of us, but it is applicable to all of us. He knew that in the hours to come, they'd one by one just disappear. Like, and even one of them said, uh, uh, 
Jesus, uh, I don't even know who you're talking about. <laughs> Denying him. And instead of getting, talk about foreknowledge, having that awareness, and yet, instead of saying, bless God, you turkey, you're about to betray me. I'm going to slap you upside of the head while I got the chance. Let you know what I think of you. No, no, no. He loved them to the end. Even knowing they were about to disappoint him. Because he had a vision. Masaya. He had a vision of farther along. That vision that said, I will see the salvation that I am affording them through my sacrifice. He had, because Jesus was fully human and fully God. And so his humanity said, you're just, you're just, I should be very angry. And indeed, in, even in that same chapter, his emotion came out because he saw the one that was about to betray him and he knew what was coming down. And it said that his emotions got to him. I bet his voice cracked when he said, one of you is about to betray me. And indeed, after that laser focus on Judas, Judas left because he couldn't handle it anymore. He couldn't handle being in the presence of love. What a sad testimony that is. Because you know, the others failed him too. But they came back. They came back. But Judas did not. And so we see this story where, where he was loving them to the very end. So he laid his garments down. He put on that apron. He washed their feet. And then even Peter, who said, you know, finally they got to Peter. And Peter was one of those people that we can all relate to at times where, you know, he speaks before he thinks. I know that doesn't happen to any of you. But sometimes there'll be a word coming out of my mouth. And I'm going, no. Come back. And it's too late. It's out. I go, ay, 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 ay. But it's a, Peter said, well, you can't wash my feet. Being more holy than God, literally. <laughs> and this is one of those moments where Jesus responded very firmly to Peter. Peter sometimes needed to be told like a guy, tell me straight, tell me straight. <laughs> he says, if you don't let me wash your feet, you will have no part in my kingdom. Like, whoa. Then Peter backs off. So, oh, hey, wash my hands, my feet, my hands, anything, because I want to be part of your kingdom. And so you have to, he's one of those lovable characters that you just get angry with, but at the very same time, you see how God absolutely is determined that we get it right in our heart, not just in the external things. And so he washed his disciples' feet. And then he said something to them, and after Judas had made his exit, he spoke. Verse 12, and he says, Do you know what I have done to you? He'd actually done something to them. By washing their feet. Verse 14 says, If I, as your Lord, your governor, your ruler, your teacher, rabbi, have washed your feet, you must wash each other's feet. So that's what we're here to speak on today. That we can love them to the end even when they are not lovable, even when they have spit in your face, even when 
They have done things that displeased you, disappointed you, broken your heart. And yet Jesus was called to love them. Now, that doesn't mean that you're supposed to be a, this doormat that, because sometimes the best way to love them is in a concrete way. Sometimes people need to be arrested from what they are doing. And that can be pretty significant. Arrested from what they're doing because you love them. Because it is the right thing for them. And so you release them into that. Uh, you know, I can see my parents, I can remember my parents doing that for me as a teenager in my stubbornness. And, and them praying to God, Lord, there's nothing we can do for this kid. You're going to have to deal with him, Lord. We can't deal with it. And so God dealt with me strongly at moments, but it was out of love. But they loved me to the end because they had that Christ-like love. And Jesus wants to place that kind of love in us. So that it is not a, a love that is based on you did me right, so I will do you right. But we love with that agape, God-like love. That is not an emotion, but a decision. So if I, as your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you must wash each other's feet. And then he came to this moment we all like a good revelation. We want to get the, we want the cliff notes. We want to hear the TED talk. We want to be inspired. We want to have that thing that is going to revolutionize our life and our existence and uh, enable us to be a success in our marriage, in our jobs, make that million dollars, do this, do that, all these wonderful things, be the perfect mother, be the perfect whatever. And it seems overwhelming. But the way he went about it, with his revelation was very profound, and yet it seemed so simple. But living it out is the great challenge. He said in verse 33, a new commandment, a new commandment. Not this, this magic formula, not this incantation, not this, you know, 15 points towards your new you. But he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. And by this, and there's the key, by this, if you want evangelism, you want to make a difference, you want to see lives revolutionized, it says, by this, not because... We have this, you know, beautiful cathedral, not because we have this great formula, not because we have these great programs, not because we are the perfect whatever in life, but by this all will know that you are my disciples. They will know you are followers of Jesus if you have love one for another. If you have love, one for another. And so we are being given the opportunity to take off. I'm not, I'm, look, I think it's wonderful to put your best foot forward. Your best you now. Sounds like a book title. It is. <laughs> Joel Osteen wrote it. <laughs> God wants you to be your best. God wants you to be as much as you're able to study, your, to show yourself approved, a workman, skilled and cunning craftsman. But having all the degrees, having all of the slick answers, even because you work harder than anybody else. I mean, there are those people that are just so driven. I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed sometimes at some people. 
how driven they are towards excellence. And I, my, I salute them. My hat is off to them. I think, how do you do that? Do you ever rest? But in the end, when everything is said and done, as wonderful as you may or may not be, and, I, and I, I, I'm not wanting you to go to that other extreme where you prove your humility by being sloppy. You know, well, we're authentic here. You know, we just, we'll just kind of let it flow. No, you, you need to do your very best. You need to have that clock back there that keeps me on track. You need to, to, as much as is possible, do your best. But in the end, it won't be our great programs. It won't be your ability to convince someone of your argument. It won't be your ability to build higher and taller and better and be faster and stronger. When it comes to matters of the heart, your ability to take someone from darkness into light, to be reflective so that people will, you know, know that you are his disciples will be by your love. It'll be by your love. Plain and simple. And that only happens when you take all of this stuff off and you get down to the nitty gritty of dealing with the messiness of humanity, of the brokenness of human beings who are in a fallen state and need hope, need a savior, need a lifeline, need that favor that is given even at moments when you say, you don't deserve it. Why should I help you? You didn't help me. I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you the hard way. You hear about the, you know, the school of hard knocks. You deserve to, to wallow in that for a little while. No, no, no. That, you will know they are my disciples by their love. If you're going to make a mistake... Let it be love. I don't think you could fail there. In fact, doesn't the word of God say love never fails? That is what's written, isn't it? Love never fails. Now, sometimes, as I said, the best way I can love you is by putting safety cushions around you of his love so that you don't hurt yourself. But I will never break someone by meanness. But I can melt them with God's loving heart. And if they're, and in the end, it's, 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 it's a person's choice. We're going to make a choice, even today. Life is filled with choices. But what a privilege and honor it is to take off those robes of our preparedness, having done we, all we could do, and then making the choice that... <coughs> we are going to be servants. We are even going to be slaves. I'm not your slave. None of you have ever said that, I suppose. <coughs> I'm not your slave. Who do you think you are? I don't work for you, bless God. I, I, I get it, okay? I, I get it. But in the end, love covers a multitude of sin. 
Yes, we're going to teach people. Yes, we're going to show them there is a better way. But let love be your guide. And let's love them to the end. And remember that if Jesus, the Messiah, if Jesus, the King, if Jesus, Lord of Lords, could so lower himself to put on that apron, clean up other people's mess. Why can't we do that once in a while? I mean, are you so anxious to prove they're wrong by saying, there's, I just thought about this, and they say it doesn't work. You know, I used to try to figure out how best to teach a dog to uh, not poop in the house or whatever. And they say, well, if you, put your, if you put their nose in it, you rub their noses in it. But you know what? It don't work that way. It just doesn't work. You can do it. You can shame them at the moment, and they will be shamed. Oh. But they've got a three-minute time span of memory, and then they're just like, and they get past it. <laughs> and that's like with our kids sometimes, no offense to those of a certain age, like, you know, where is your brain? What are you thinking? Why? What is wrong with you? But it, it, as you keep bringing, back, bringing them back to those safe boundaries, sooner or later, something will click. Sooner or later, we have to believe that God is going to Bring it, the light will go on. But we continue loving them to the end. And as we give that, then the world, including those that we love and even including those that we don't particularly love, but by faith we say, you know, God, you have called me to be a light in darkness, to give hope where there is no hope, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. God's job to judge. And my job to love. This is the end of the teaching from our pastors. For more information, visit thecrossroads.org or download our app in the App Store. Thank you for listening.